I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Capella University is rethinking higher education. With its game-changing FlexPath learning format, you can earn your degree on your schedule and fit your education seamlessly into your life. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. Today on the James Altucher Show. Let's say you want to you wanna write a, a book in the next 30 days. So, like, there's all these, like, guidebooks. I feel like all these thousand-year-old stories, they fall under two categories. One is sort of the listicle of how to behave, and the other is kind of the story. So there's yeah. the story of Jesus, the story of Krishna, the story of Buddha. So all of those are kind of, you know, these seminal stories, these archetypical stories that you could write a, a novel around, or these guides to living that Buddha, Jesus, you know, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, whoever came up with, you could write like the Tao of cybersecurity or the Tao of parenting or the Tao of whatever. Oh, I was going to write the Tao of, of comedy. I yeah. really, it's an idea I had. It's because as soon as I read your article, I thought I wrote a paper in college in my early uh, philosophy of early China class about the Zhuangzi and comedy. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to take that article and turn it into an Amazon book and then throw it yeah, out to the world. Why exactly. not? Like, okay, hold on. That's exactly up. what came to mind. And then I had three other ideas really quickly. That's stoicism and sales and a handful of other things. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go Dow quotes and let's take, let's take, here's 20 inspiring quotes from Lao Tzu. So now you can even have images you could put on each chapter. The best thing about this is that you guys are watching and listening to this, but James is going to be charging thousands of dollars for a class for this in no, like a month. But, I, but <laughs> I, I, I wrote the article all for free and I told people just write a book in three days. Yeah. Um, okay, then I okay, am. Here's, here, yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, okay, this is perfect for comedy. Here's a loud two quote from the Dow Day Ching. Nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. Go, apply it to comedy. Oh, I mean, that's timing. You know yeah. what the number one rule of comedy is? Timing. Right, and also, if you panic in the middle of your set, like, let's say people are not laughing. Yeah. A lot of comedians have a tendency to speed up because they're yeah. afraid. Oh, yeah. But actually, the exact advice, the correct advice is to slow, slow down, down. Yep. and get kind of back in your in your, in That's your body, exactly. in that your frame. Patience saves you on stage way more than just taking action. Right, and then you could show examples from Richard Pryor, Rodney Dangerfield. All these Pry different clips, you know. yeah. Tons um, of stuff. Okay, so let's find another one. But isn't singularity concept kind of like popularized by movies and stuff? Yeah, but they're all just wrong. Yeah. I mean, there was like all these movies. There's a whole bunch of movies that came out in like the early and mid aughts that were all about like a big computer got who has access to everything. It's turning all the lights red. Oh my God, no one could go anywhere. Like it yeah. just was, that was ever, the plot of like every film. During yeah, that ever since time. like basically. Terminator, right? No, um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Right? Did that earlier, right? Arthur C. Clarke. No, 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 Arthur C. Clarke's with 1969. Cal, Cal 9, 1969. Oh. Yeah, or even earlier. I don't, I don't know. Um, 
I think it was, that's a good question. I think it was 65, 66. Or you can also argue Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Yes. Yeah, but then it's not AI. Then, Frankenstein was alive and it was a robot. Yeah, but he was a dead person. It's not computer. Frankenstein wasn't dead. No, no, it was, it was like, not dead, dead, but like, it was, it's a collection of human parts. 1968. All right, so you're saying it done. woke up some human part from before. Right, okay. Right, right. So, so it's like, it's, it used to be like a superstitious, like when people die, they have a soul and yeah, they, yeah. they can, gotcha. can get another soul into another body. Jay lecturing me on on eighteen hundreds <laughs> English literature. That's good. <laughs> I'm trying to believe in, in reincarnation. So. Yeah. Well. You believe in reincarnation? I uh, know. Okay. Because well, well. <laughs> that, that's what we study. Because Buddhism and Taoism doesn't really believe in reincarnation. Um, in Buddhism is kind. Of a little it depends bit. on what like Zen Buddhism. No. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and Buddha himself was sort of neutral, other than to just explain yeah. Buddhism to Hindus. But some other branches, you know. Yeah, from, Tibetan Buddhism does. Yeah, they're like, they're like, if you if you if you die, you go to hell. You go through these bridges, and that depends what you did in your past life. You either reincarnate into like a cow or into animal or into grass. Right. So I sort of feel like that's the Hindu slant on Buddhism, but it's not like it's not like the Chinese or the Buddhism is sort of half born out of hinduism yeah. anyway so they kind of take you know some yeah. of the contact well but okay so my okay so my understanding of this is that the that b b the buddha was the first one to be to break the cycle of endless reincarnation which was that he become through becoming a bodhisattva realized uh became enlightened and then broke that cycle and that's essentially what the concept of following the eightfold path is so i i think i think so a couple of comments on that is that <laughs> I think, you know, Buddha was basically addressing Hindus in all of his talks. It's unclear yeah. whether he believed any of that, but his whole point was, is that following, following this, the four noble truths of Buddhism is that you could break the cycle and stop reincarnating. But it was unclear whether he actually believed in reincarnation or whether he believed in any God. There's some evidence there's a there's um a book by Stephen Batchelor who was a Buddhist priest for a long time, uh, Confessions of a Buddhist Atheist, and he really digs into what's called the Pali Canon, which are the actual words of Buddha, mm. where there's no mention of any theism at all. That, that Buddha might actually have not ever spoken about any hin gods or goddesses or or uh, you know polytheistic or monotheistic. It might have just be Buddha had this philosophy that never mentioned religion at all. Yeah, but the Eightfold Path. That was more just about if you're not going to do kind of this, you know, meditation and follow Buddha's exact path, there's this other path of just righteous living. So you quote unquote, at least reincarnate better, Yeah. Um, which is, I think, separate from um, how he religiously felt, but thought that, okay, th if you're not going to do the full thing, at least do this so you live a good life. Yeah. This is like that's like the the that's like the guidebook for normal people. Yeah, the it's kind of like Buddhism light. guide to was the April Buddhism path. light. <laughs> it's like the like the handbook for 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 people who yeah who want some some Buddhism. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Because isn't it? It's like you know, right words, right this, right that. Like it's just about Got it. living a good life, and and you don't have to meditate, but you're this you'll be happier if you do it this way. It's also kind of yoga that's like that as well, where just i forgot what the name of it is but it's just instead of doing the full yoga it's just just uh live this good charitable life and that's a kind that's a branch of yoga as well but it's yeah, not going to give you the full benefits of yoga yeah good and good enough basically is yeah where you're good just, enough yoga yeah good enough religion i i guess like it's weird because i suppose you your choice i feel like it, it's weird because there's no if you're a christian you've got to be a monk <laughs> there's one way to go or like but the, i feel like you don't have an option of like doing that light like you got to go to church and like do all this stuff. No, but light you could say is, uh, uh, you know, living a good life, going to, you know, whether you're a Catholic or Christian, going to church once a week. Anglicanism. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> and the serious side is Southern Baptist. And, and Anglicanism also is more, more about, um, when you pray, it's like a direct communication with God as opposed to kind of this, this intermediary, like a Pope or, 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 yeah, priest, a priest or, or something. Yeah. And, um, and then you can say, you could argue that, um, being a, a, a priest or a minister or a reverend is what you need to do to be fully 
you know, like a Buddhist monk or something like that. Well, it's weird. You, Joseph Campbell talks about that. He he attended one of the first like global interfaith conferences. I'm a big fan of Campbell, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Big fan of Campbell, and uh, and he attended one of the 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 first interfaith conferences globally. And it was funny because he said that all of the cl the clerics of each religion, who were like the the priests and and pastors and you know whatever. Uh, all disagreed with each other, but all of the monks of every religion completely got along with each other like super well. The people who were like living it got along way better than the people who were just like t talking about it and talking about the specifics of it, which I thought was kind of fascinating. Yeah, it is interesting because I guess on one hand, you're dealing with a lot more bureaucratic issues, which you, you could, everybody could disagree with. But on the other hand, when you get to the core, there is this always this sense that they're all kind of the, the same. But I like Jay, you're, you've mentioned to me, you're, you, you were raised both Buddhist and Taoist. And you could argue they're very, at the core, they're almost exactly the same. Like Zen Buddhism and Taoism are almost exactly the same. Yeah, this would be a good person. It's just that what's really different is the superstitious that believe, right? Taoism believe more in like ghosts and, you know, like... Taoism believes in ghosts? Yeah, they like... <laughs> right, right. Well, when you take, when you go, right. So when you get to the structurally, as outside of the Tao Te Ching, which doesn't mention ghosts, which is the only real textbook in the main Taoism... Um, if you go to the cultures that grew up in it, there's all these rituals, just like with Buddhism, there's Tibetan Buddhism and, and all these others, but just at the core, Zen Buddhism and Taoism seem similar. The only difference I would say is Taoism can also be interpreted as completely a political book and not a religious book at all. So some people have interpreted it that way that all, cause all the advice can be taken just politically. Like, and, and as if it was just like Confucius wrote his texts for a leader, it could be argued Lao Tzu wrote his text for a leader. Who is the, who is the, there was a rabbi who, who someone challenged him and said, can you re recite the entire of the Talmud for uh, standing on one foot? And then he like lifted his leg and he said, do not do unto others what would be reprehensible if done unto yourself. The rest is commentary. Huh. And like that, I feel like I like that. I, I, who's, That's a good story. Yeah. I forget who said that, but uh, I heard it through Christopher Hitchens. Like another, another atheist, which is a, uh, which is an interesting word. Like all these people say, oh, I'm an atheist. In other words, they're an ist, right? <laughs> so they believe in some basically religion or cult or whatever. I feel like it takes a lot to go like, there's no God definitively. I mean, like, how do you know? Well, like, and also then it's like, what makes you different from any other religious practitioner? Like here, now you have to come up with a set of a, a code to live by yeah. or, or not. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people just don't think about it, but all those people who kind of like raise their hands, like no atheism, and they go marching in the streets about it practically, or they can't talk to people unless it's, you know, who have anything, you know, religious to say. It's sort of like a religion by itself. Oh my God. It's I so went, annoying. I went on a date with this, with this woman in, uh, in, in New York. And on the first, like within the first five minutes, she said to me, we're at this, we're at this bar called Bua, by the way, in East Village, which is great. Anyway, we're at this bar, and in the first five minutes, she's like, what do you believe in? Do you believe in God or what? And I'm like, well, that's a complicated answer. And she's like, what do you mean? Like, do you or not? And I'm like, well, how into, I'm like, we, I just met you. Like, how into this do you want to get? And so I start, like, telling her all my, like, beliefs and stuff. I'm like, well, because I, I, this was a huge part of my life for a long time. I read a ton of Joseph Campbell and, like, come from a family that's, like, d tons of different faiths in a part of, the you know, Metro Detroit that was, like, all these different faiths. And I, as I'm telling her this stuff, she's like, I can feel her like tightening up and she's getting like really weird. And she's like, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to go. And I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? She's like, you just clearly believe that there's like a God and he controls your life. And he like, I'm like, I didn't say any of these things. Like, and she's like freaking out about this. And I just, from now on, I'm like, you know what? I'm not even approaching that topic with people. <laughs> it, it reminds me of, uh, so in this brief period between marriage number one and marriage number two, I went on a date and this is where social media can both help and hurt. So I saw this girl was interested in the Kabbalah, which is like this kind oh, yeah. of um, Jewish, very yeah, Jewish mysticism. So that day, I didn't know anything about the Kabbalah at all. So that day, I went to the bookstore, bought like six books on Kabbalah, skimmed through all of them, and then acted on the date like I didn't know what she was at all. But then I would start like dropping in like these <laughs> kind of clauses or yeah. like really meaningful. Yeah, yeah I know shit. And she's like, "Oh, <laughs> are you also?" And then you know. It was very manipulative on my part. It got, it, it, she was very like happy to have met me and was, was calling for like the next week or so. And I just wasn't interested. But again, the dangers of, 
back then social media not everybody was using social media to dig up all the information oh, yeah. of people that's so funny i uh yeah i just gonna sidestep that whole conversation now and if everybody ever, ever asked me what i am i go scientologist uh that's what i 110 percent am the world was created by uh by Thetan, thetans yeah by uh by xenu um, well but this is okay <laughs> this is where joseph campbell comes in so actually i like this as this is what i just recommended in a joseph campbell kind of idea that you could basically write a book in 30 days I, not only did you joseph just campbell. recommend this i'm 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 a completely doing oh yeah this. you read it. i saw you like that uh, I, I read it and i was like james just i was like i just I, I i think i was at my computer and i started and i jumped away from it and my girlfriend was like what or what are you what the hell and i was like i know exactly what my next three projects are gonna be like <laughs> right because you could literally write with what we're about to describe you could literally write a book a month for the rest of your life oh easily <laughs> easily so so and it's because of joseph Campbell, by the way kind of connecting the dots so basically what he says essentially is that there is these primal stories that we all relate to and if you could structure your story within one of these primal structures your story is going to be a bestseller. So George Lucas, who came essentially just a few years after Joseph Campbell wrote that, jo George Lucas said, huh, I'm going to apply this uh, to basically a, a, a science fiction Western, space a space fantasy, Western. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Joseph Campbell's thing is the arc of the hero. Like the hero gets this call to action and uh, he rejects it at first, but then he yeah. has to go on it. And then he meet he has bigger and bigger problems and he meets, um, you know, more and more useful friends until finally the final battle. And then he comes back to tell a story. But the whole, the real idea is, is that there are these structures, these story structures that have been focus grouped by billions of people over the past 3000 years, where if you steal that structure, focus. you know, it's going to work. So for instance, um, uh, have you ever seen the movie The Legend of Bagger Vance or read yeah, the book? Yeah, yeah, So, so That's it's the one you use in the, yeah. Yeah, the, so Stephen Pressfield, who's been on this podcast, he wrote this book. It was a major bestseller, and then it was a major movie starring Will Smith and Matt Damon. Matt Damon's this golfer in the 1920s. Will Smith is this quasi-mystical caddy that just shows up and helps oh, yeah. him. And, and later, Stephen Pressfield wrote a book called The Authentic Swing, which said he, beat by beat, like every single chapter in the that novel, The Legend of Bagger Vance, including the names of all the characters, comes from the Bhagavad Gita, which is like the seminal religious text for all of Hinduism. Yeah. And he just, I don't want to say he stole it, but he totally stole that text <laughs> and just replaced And instead of putting it on a battlefield in the middle of India with Krishna as the charioteer of Arjuna, he has the golfer is Arjuna. Uh, uh, Will Smith is the is the Krishna character, and it's in 1920s Georgia, and it's not a war; it's a golf tournament. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's like it's crazy because there's you, that can apply to like so much. Th that's when that's what why I loved that uh, that article is I was like, oh my god, this applies to so many things. That this is stuff is just lying around. That like Pablo Picasso has that quote where he says, "Good artists uh, borrow, great artists steal." And you're like, well, there's something to that because there's like not just the legend of Beggar Vance, but think about uh, Mary Poppins, which is a movie I, I love, and I'm like, I'm like obsessed with it. I think it's got way more layers than people give it credit for. Like, it's a fantastic. It's if I could be anything in my life, I just want to be a Bert from from Mary Poppins. I just want to sing and dance. Is that the is that the the little kid? No, no, no. Bert is the uh, Bert is the character played by uh, by what's his name the uh, the actor the. Um, Dick Van Dyke. Oh, yeah, okay. he's played by Dick Van Dyke, and he just sings and dances, has a terrible British accent, and uh, is a, a, entirely charming and hangs out with Julie Andrews the whole time. I want, I just want to be that guy, like in my life. But I think I feel like I want to be Dick Van Dyke in every single show he's ever been in. He's amazing, like a TV writer in the Dick Van Dyke show. Dude, he's uh, amazing. The uh, doctor from uh, whatever that show was, where he played the doctor. And then there was Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yeah, yeah. yeah so he's like just a cool, handsome guy. Yeah, I'd and he be just him. and at like almost ninety years old. He's in the sequel to Mary Poppins, jumping up on a desk and like dancing, and like the guys. I mean, he's he's amazing. So anyway, I wanted to. I just that's my whole life. All I've wanted to do is be Bert from. Mary Poppins. Uh, but like even even like, so thinking of like children's book, even like the cat in the hat is the arc of the hero, right? These well, yeah. two little kids get the call to action when the cat 
shows up at their door. Yeah. And then it just gets more and more insane and more, yeah. you know, thing one and thing two show up and like all this crazy stuff happens. And then finally at the end, they have the story to tell. Well, that's what I was gonna say is like, that's exactly Mary Poppins is like a semi, like a quasi celestial being who comes down and you can, all of these, I mean, even uh, uh, the the author of that book, whose name escapes me at the time, um, sh she she even talks about how she was very influenced by all of this like Eastern philosophy to create this this book basically and, and this story. Right. So, for instance, let's say you want to you want to write a, a book in the next thirty days. Let's say you're interested in parenting. So, Robin, you're sitting here. You're interested in parenting. You read all these books on parenting. You can either write Zen and the art of parenting, and or or and then you could take you just mentioned earlier the eightfold path in Buddhism. You could apply each one of those points to good parenting like oh, here, yeah. here's the eightfold path here are the eight steps you need to be a good parenting and you can either call it zen and the art of parenting or don't mention that you're stealing this from zen or buddhism at all and say this is the the eight steps to being the ideal parent and just steal word for word completely the eightfold <laughs> path no one's going to give a shit because it's just you know their words and and no one will even know oh well, this uh, she stole this from buddha from 300 bc <laughs> No one's going to say that. And and yet, then well, what, you take- What was Buddha doing with it? It was right. just lying around. <laughs> and 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 then there's then you fill in your own, for each point on the Eightfold Path, I got to look up, what's the Eightfold Path now? Like, I forget the exact eight points, but you, for each point, you could think of your own personal stories and you could weave in the stories of others and you could re weave in situations and research yeah. and some, boom, you'll have a book that's perfectly Well, this is structured. like Ryan Holiday kind of has a whole, he did this with Stoicism and so did- Right, uh, he totally takes- every aspect of stoicism and then one aspect at a time you know kind of writes a book about it and we already know it's going to be a success because it's been already a success for 2500 years yeah so it's already great it, it, people have it, and by the way let's say there are millions of ideas that have people have come up with in the past 2500 years this is one of the seven that have survived those millions of ideas so we know that society after society century after century these ideas have flourished and he's just bringing it into the, not just, but he's bringing it into the, the, the modern day. So we know that concept is going to be successful. So now hold on, I'm going to look up what the eightfold, eightfold path is. Yeah. Just Are we going to do this live and then talk about how to be an eightfold parent? Yeah, exactly. Or, or, or whatever, <laughs> whatever anybody's interested in. Well, well, okay. So, uh, well, Wikipedia always has to make it more complicated. I just want the eight points. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like, uh, uh, right speech. Okay. Is number three. So, okay, what you say to your kids matters. Yeah, it matters. <laughs> Chapter and three. And then you tell stories like, okay, if you act like, um, if you're always complaining when you get home from work, your kid's going to grow up kind of <laughs> like just, whining and complaining and being a, a, a victim. You know? I just love, the greatest thing about this too is I think we just discovered that it doesn't almost even matter what you write <laughs> because it's like, it's founded on this great document. But like, right, right. So if you, if, you, if you just have the first, if you just have the chapters, you know, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood. Okay. Someone could read the chapters and say, oh yeah, I'm glad I bought this book. Now I know what to do with my kids. Or you could start going into each chapter. And by the way, for a book to be self-published on Amazon, 30 pages, 60 pages, it doesn't oh, it matter. it doesn't have to be anything. Right. Yeah. You could write one page per chapter here, but everyone's got stories. If I, when I say right speech, it brings to mind different things. For everyone, like yeah. okay, what you say, which is, your kids but it's will also do. like a part of what I'm. I feel like part of what we just learned in this lesson is that thousands of years ago, the only thing you had to do in order to be prolific was to have an idea, like hey, like maybe try to say good things, yeah. like that. That's <laughs> literally what that that idea is. There's no specifics, right? But then it doesn't change. Like you could still, like my dad gave me that advice, right, right, <laughs> right, exactly. So your dad, so that's a story in there, or or you know, we have kids, so we can think about the times where we've said bad things and then later on hurt our kids yeah. repeat it whether it was a you know just uh you know using bad language or kind if of if you're listening to this just send this audio transcript at temmy.com and this is your book like we've already <laughs> written it for you right so 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 and, and again you know it's almost better not to say zen and the art of parenting because then people will have these preconceived notions oh why are they using yeah. zen? it's better to say like you know call your book the ultimate parent or you know, which is Nirvana, yeah. but as a parent, or, or, you know, eight steps to, to, you know, eight easy steps to being the best parent on the planet or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, right effort is one of, one of the points It's point number six on the eightfold path. So, okay. You don't tell your kids to work I hard. Just, you just <laughs> use as an example, use yourself as an example. This is what it's like to work hard. I'm working hard, but this is time now I'm devoting to you and I'm very focused 
on you, the, the children. So, so uh, the, uh, you know, showing what right effort is so that they, you model it for the kid. And then I'm sure there's research on this and I'm sure there's you can other start stories. Plugging, all plugging all this stuff in. Yeah, there right. you go. That's a, so then at and each then one of those points, all you gotta history. do is start throwing in research and stuff and be like, yeah, here we go. It's a well-researched book. Right. <laughs> and you know, the structure works because again, there was millions of ideas talked about and millions of listicles made in 300 BC, between 300 <laughs> BC and now, but this one happens to be, you know, a billion people like this one, the eightfold path. So, oh my uh, gosh. this war. So what's another topic? So there's, uh, you know, cybersecurity. Yeah. Have, there we go. Know, cybersecurity. Eight, eight steps to, the eight um, steps. Uh, 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 a cybersecurity policy for right, the government. Or right for, actions. <laughs> right words. Yeah, yeah. Right it's words. Like, right what? actions. Like, like. <laughs> but it's, Jay, it's like. Okay. I, so first of all, here's all right. So this is every single one of these ideas is great because it's like you really could write a book on it. But like, none, none of this explains like any of these subjects. I feel like, like. <laughs> well, but maybe not because, or maybe yes because. Look, right speech. Elliot Spitzer was once. Uh, uh, giving a talk to a, a conference of lawyers pre his whole prostitution scandal, whatever, uh, when he was still a, sure. a, a DA. And he said to the lawyers, the greatest thing you guys have done for this is emailing with your clients because he subpoenas all the emails and finds the crimes. <laughs> so right speech right there is, uh, you know, ha uh, they, they all should have practiced right speech. They all should have practiced right action, like not email each other, maybe meet people face to face if you yeah. want to conceal your crimes. Like, uh, uh, you know, right <laughs> mindfulness. Be careful what you're doing when you're just sending someone a text. Hey, Be aware. Think about, that. Hey, think about shit before you do it. Right, exactly. <laughs> like, that's the whole, that's literally advice my dad gave me. Like, I was like, dad, should I become a lawyer or should I become a comedian? And what he should have said is, well, do you like money or not? But what he said instead was, yeah, I think you should think about it. I'm like, I, this doesn't help me at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, but, the, but the fifth, I mean, the like. Fifth, the fifth step on the eightfold path is right livelihood. So <laughs> he was. He was trying to give you the right livelihood, <laughs> and you have a story. You have a personal story, and then there, then there's all this research about what leads to happiness. Is happiness the goal? What income is needed for happiness? Yeah. And that's all falls under the right livelihood chapter. Yeah. And again, you don't have to refer. This is, by the way, we're taking Buddhism and applying it to how to live a good life. No, it's just like you write a book, a good life, and you just have these eight chapters. The good by life. the way, we're only we only picked we picked randomly because yeah. we discussed it we're earlier. We're talking the, about the yeah, but we can half. do it. This is, I just love, it. and then Stephen Pressfield can write a, a book about how you, he's like, this, how to live a good life was ripped word for word from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The authentic parent yeah, the authentic is not authentic parent. at all, but how Buddha would be a parent. He ripped uh, this word from word from Mein Kampf. It, no. yeah, so, <laughs> so, so like there's all these like guidebooks. I feel like all these, you know, thousands, thousand year old stories. They fall under two categories. One is sort of the listicle of how to behave, and the other is kind of the story. So there's yeah. the story of Jesus, the story of Krishna, the story of Buddha. So all of those are kind of, you know, these seminal stories, these archetypical stories that you could write a, a novel around, or these guides to living that Buddha, Jesus, you know, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, whoever came up with, you could write like the Tao of cybersecurity or the Tao of parenting or the Tao of whatever. Oh, I so, was going to write the Tao of, of comedy. I yeah. really, it's an idea I had. It's because as soon as I read your article, I thought I wrote a paper in college in my early, uh, philosophy of early China class about the Zhuangzi and comedy. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to take that article and turn it into an Amazon book and then throw it yeah, out into the world. Why exactly. not? Like, right, hold on. That's exactly up. what came to mind. And then I had three other ideas really quickly. That's stoicism and sales and a, a handful of other things. So I'm going to, I'm going to just go Tao quotes and let's take Let's take, here's 20 inspiring quotes from Lao Tzu. So now you can even have images you could put on each chapter. The best thing about this is that you guys are watching and listening to this, but James is going to be charging thousands of dollars for a class for this in no, like a month. But, I, but I, <laughs> I, I wrote the article all for free and I told people just write a book in three days. Yeah. Um, okay, then I okay, am. Here's, here, yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, okay, this is perfect for comedy. Here's a Lao Tzu quote from the Tao Te Ching. Nature does not hurry, yet everything is accomplished. Go apply it to comedy. Oh, I mean that's timing. You know yeah. what the number one rule of comedy is? Timing. Right, and also if you panic in the middle of your set, like let's say people are not laughing. Yeah, a lot of comedians have a tendency to speed up because they're yeah. afraid. Oh yeah. But actually, the exact advice, it, the correct advice, is to slow, slow down, down. Yep. and get kind of back in your in your in that's your body exactly. in that, your frame. It, it, the patient saves you on stage way more than uh, than just taking action. Right, and then you could show examples from. 
Richard Pryor, Rodney Dangerfield. All George these Pro different you know, clips, yeah. Tons um, of stuff. Okay, so let's find another one. Um, um, okay, uh, here's, I'm just picking randomly. I don't, know, I don't even know what the quote is until I read it. A leader is best when people barely know he exists. When his work is done, his aim fulfilled, they will say, we did it ourselves. Okay, trick here, apply it to comedy. So Ooh. I'll say it again. Uh, a leader is best when people barely know he exists. When he, and when his work is done, his aim fulfilled, all the people will say, we did it ourselves. Actually, I'm going to flip that around and say this. There's a Ben Franklin quote. Uh, I don't know if he really said it, but I saw it in the John Adams uh, made-for-TV like you know miniseries on HBO where he said, in France, one must, uh, f one must fulfill the art of accomplishing much while appearing to accomplish little. And I think that that's true of comedy. Which right, is so that's that, the same as this. So he's basically, yeah. he basically stole this quote. He figured <laughs> nobody in France has read the Dao De Ching and he, he reworded it in his own words. And that's, that quote has survived well, you think, 300 like, you years think, but until like, you think just about said Chappelle, it. Because let's add to the context here. Think about Chappelle in his, in his last few specials. Especially, this especially applies to the bird revelation though. That special, which is he's on stage uh, and he even talks about it, like with uh, Iceberg Slim and uh, and the the book Pimp. Like it's the same thing. Like he he has to know, he has to be, he has to appear like a complete master with effortless control over everything that he's doing, because that appearance actually does matter and it is relevant. And so he has to allow people in this in the space that he's in to think this guy is so nonchalant. He's a complete virtuoso in what he's doing. Meanwhile, Dave Chappelle has been on stage how many times? Has been writing how much? Has been I mean all of this is like all background. But but I'll I'll take it further with that set of Dave Chappelle specials. A lot of times people will comment about Dave Chappelle. Yeah, I'm pretty sure he was just riffing right there on the spot and making it up. So Dave Chappelle, the performer slash comedian really didn't exist on stage, mm. even though he had done every single joke and line and even movement probably thousands of times mm. across, on stages across America just to prepare for those Netflix specials. You weren't aware that he, that material existed. You thought that this was just coming from his core. Yeah, as opposed spontaneously to creating from his being. Like for instance, in that series of specials, I forgot the name of, of which one this was, but he says, okay, before the end of this show, I'm going to talk about the four different times I met OJ Simpson. Yeah. And then the show ends after the third time yep. and he, and everybody's standing up clapping he goes behind the, the curtains close and he's like wait 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 and he comes back and says i forgot to tell you about the fourth time so clearly he didn't forget clearly that was part of the act yeah. but you don't have this set he the, the comedian side seemed to have disappeared the material you have no sense that he's doing material and that's really what this is saying here is that get rid of all the 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 notion for a comedian get rid of the notion of material don't let them see that you're doing material yeah. make it seem spontaneous and by the way the th let them think they did it themselves probably everybody was wondering before he came back did he say did he the even fourth forget time? yeah did we forget what happened and then like all of that questioning and then I'd say the second thing to that is in his last special sticks and stones after the credits there's he there's an, a whole twenty minute story if you watch the whole thing through the credits suddenly uh, secret you can't click on it to watch it later. You don't know it exists unless you watch the whole special. Other 20 minutes of Dave Chappelle telling the story come comes up after the special. And like that's the kind of thing that that is like purely orchestrated. But the non, I mean, the feeling of like surprise and delight, instantaneous nonchalantness, all of that comes out. You feel like you're experiencing this with Dave Chappelle right now in this moment versus you're part of an entire plan and strategy he had. You're riding a roller coaster, but you don't even know it. Right, so boom, the Dow of comedy. We or, <laughs> just wrote it. What? What other? What other? Uh, you said three projects. What other projects based on this idea? Oh, uh, well, one was the uh, the uh, stoicism in sales, which is something I thought about for a while. All right, let me look up. Because like I've had this whole career doing sales because comedy doesn't pay the bills. Um, well, unless unless you're unless, Dave unless you can freestyle rap like. Uh, what did who did you? Oh have yeah, on here Chris recently? Turner. Chris Turner. Yeah, yeah. that guy is that guy was ridiculously amazing. talented. He's got a somebody needs to scan his brain because there's got to be something weird with his brain in like a good. I mean, you know what I mean, like a good way. Because yeah. he's there's just the, the dude's verbal recall is unbelievable, and he's talking about how he doesn't know anything about like the Cleveland Browns, but then like Cleveland Brown information comes up in his yeah, brain. Yeah, he's like he's like quoting like Cleveland Browns players from the forties and yeah, like you know, he's got to be a savant. Like he had an epileptic seizure when he was three, and like now his brain is like open up to all these like different powers or something. If 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 he if he had been if this had been in the nineteen sixties, Stanley would have used him to create a character for Marvel. Yeah, because just that, like kind uh, of rap all the criminals. Like, the, <laughs> just, he would just the death. Uh, start 
start rapping about them and they would be so mesmerized the police would catch them. They were just like, I'm gonna, the entire time I'm in jail, I'm just gonna practice rapping just like that superhero, that mutant, that mutant animal. All right, here's a, here's a quote from Epictetus, a famous Stoic. Yep, uh, he wrote the Enchiridion. I didn't know that, see? so Greek for handbook. The, the Stoicism of sales. So, okay, here's a quote. Just keep in mind, the more we value things outside our control, the less control we have. Bang. So the, so this is exactly how I would describe, this is why I, this is a good idea in the book, is in sales, what do you know you can't control? You can't control anything that the other decisions the other people are making. I, I used to tell this to my sales team all the time at uh, at the two last companies I was director at, which was like, you, you, you need to draw a circle and it says, and this is your locus of control. You need to constantly be moving things within your locus of control. So don't wait for someone else to come up with an idea of when the next meeting can take place. Don't wait for them to do a proposal to their bosses in their organization. You need to go, Here's, here are the dates that work. Please choose one of these dates. Or what about this date? Let me just send you a calendar invite. Or I, would, it be, would you be okay with me putting together a presentation that either I can give your boss with your permission or that I can give it to you and you can present it to their boss? Or just every single one of these steps, you want to constantly be looking at what can I control and influence directly versus what I have to rely on others for. Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra- I am I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt you can wear confidently. I like that they've got very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like, I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks, 
even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's the easiest hundred dollars you're ever gonna make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily Fantasy Sports Made Easy. A lot of times people write me emails saying, oh, I'd love to be an intern for you. What what do you need? And that's such a bad approach. Like yeah. they're kind of outsourcing. They're kind of yeah. giving me homework to help them. Yeah. I, you, did you talk about this with Jordan Harbinger? Yeah, I feel probably. Like, yeah, yeah, because people, he this is his complaint also, is he's like, I don't, it's like it's work for me to come up with. So that's my, so that's what it is, is you want to go, how do I make the barrier to entry so low for this other person that I'm doing their job for them? So, so that, seriously, why don't you write sto- like stoicism in, in, and sales? Cool. And, See and you then, in 30 days on Amazon. And then, and then you'll have your 60-page book. You'll hand it, hand it out, and you'll start getting big speaking gigs to go speak at sales conferences because stoicism is so hot right now. Yeah. You'll be the stoic sales guy. And then you'll speak at every sales conference. You know, Procter and Gamble will hire you for their to speak to their sales team, and uh, you'll hand out your booklet to everybody. They have yeah. to buy all the booklet, the, the yeah. books. And I'll have like the uh, yeah, I'll have the workbook, and then I'll have the I'll teach I'll teach a course in which you can be certified to then teach this. Like, <laughs> let me see. Um, uh, okay, here's another stoic quote. It's from Seneca. Uh, it does it does not matter what you bear, but how you bear it. Yeah. Boom. I mean, go. There's another one. So so. Uh, the way that I think I would apply this to sales is I would just say you're, you, you, you do not have a choice in the things that you have to do at any given time if you're, if you're working through sales. But the thing that you do have a choice about is how you're going to approach it and what you're going to do because of it. So if you got to make a number by the end of the month, you're going to have to deal with that. If you have to give three presentations in three days in three different cities, you're going to have to make decisions on how you can deal with that. And if you accept that this is the way that your life is going to be for the next given period of time, suddenly it becomes a lot easier. And I've always thought refusing, and this is a big lesson that I learned when I was traveling doing sales. Um, I would have to fly from Texas to Minnesota to Can- to Yellowknife, Canada, and the Northwest oh, Territories. It sounds like it sucks. <laughs> what? Not what? the book. Oh, yeah. I was like, what? Just uh, the no, life. It's coming off the top of my the, dome, James. The life of sales. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. That's why I don't have that job anymore. But I was traveling all over the place. But what didn't suck about it is as soon as I stopped fighting that I was like, this is what my life is going to be, I started, it suddenly opened my brain up to new options where I was like, I can do workouts in my uh, hotel. I can go out to different places. I did comedy all over the U.S. and Canada because I would just go find an open mic or a club anywhere I was. And so, like, how many comedians can say they've done stand-up in Yellowknife, Northwest Territories of Canada? I can because I went out to the Black Raven and did a com- and did a set at an open mic. But, like, as soon as I opened it up, I decided to choose how I was going to do it rather than if I was going to do it. And that changed completely. I got a really good buddy. Who's, uh, who's actually also a comedian in L.A. His name's Chuck Kavalik. And I think about this a lot. He told me once, um, things are only going to be how you make them. And I feel like that that applies. It's not what you're going to bear, but how you can bear it. And it, it yeah, and uh, so I'll apply. It. I mean, that was circuitous, but I think I got it. No, no, I think that was good. So, so the quote is, it does not matter what you bear, but how you bear it. I'll give you another example from sales. Let's say someone just simply rejects you, okay? You can't change it. It's out of your control from the other quote. Yeah. So, so it's not, you can't, and, and, and also it makes no sense to be sad, but now you have a decision. Okay. They just said no to this one sales attempt, but that doesn't mean they're going to say no a year later. Yeah. So what I've done in the past with, with prior, uh, jobs is I kind of create a newsletter 
not, a, not an official newsletter, but I'll write once a month to that person. Yep. Hey, here's an update on how our company's doing, how the product's doing, yep. how how I'm doing. You know, I noticed this from your company. Congratulations. Maybe we can help you with this, this, this. And inevitably, let's say it's six months, 12 months, 18 months, they usually come back and say, oh, maybe can you come in and explain that to the yeah. team again? And suddenly they might, they might become a client. So yeah. it's, it's how you bear it. Like, okay, you move forward and you create value for that person um, as opposed to just being like, oh, they're jerks for rejecting me. I got two things to say to this because now that we're now that my brain is spinning on it. The first is that this is almost the same advice that Victor E. Frankel gave in Man's Search for Meaning. Boom, again, take Man's Search for Meaning and apply <laughs> it to sales. The, a salesman's search for meaning, meaning. go. <laughs> yeah, I, love, I love that. The, um, yeah, so. From the Holocaust to, to the sales to, room. To the, to the, yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, uh, I, so, okay. So what I was going to say though, is that the, 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 the idea of, um, uh, uh, it's, it's fundamental. It's like, where do you think sales come from? So my, my, you know, first principles thinking is something that people talk about a lot, but I kind of applied it because I think, you know, not again, what are you going to bear, but how are you going to bear it? Let's say somebody doesn't buy from you. Do sales occur because somebody has a specific need and they fill that need with whatever is available at the time? Maybe. But also maybe what sales is actually is a process of relationship development in which one level of that relationship is transactional. And if somebody has a need that needs mm. to be filled with something you're offering, then they'll do it. But if sales require trust and trust is a process of um, consistency of action over time, then the rapport that you build and keep will result over that period of time in eventually enough trust that someone will pay you for something. Right. So again, it's it's the it does not matter what you what you bear, but how you bear it. How because you bear it. those first um, 16 times. And actually, so Steve Cohen, when he reaches out to potential podcast guests, he always says it takes 16 touches, not yeah. necessarily 16 emails in a row, but like, oh, here's tickets to this. Would you like some? Or here's yeah. a party I'm going to. Would you like to go? Or here's, would you want this guy for your specific podcast as opposed to coming yeah. on James' podcast? So 16 different touches and suddenly you built that trust and now you could ask them again, yeah. come, can you come on the podcast? And it's, again, it's how you bear this, this potentially negative start to a relationship. I have. Yeah. It's interesting because I, first of all, I just said this in my, in my online course about cold emailing. Um, a 1% is like industry standard for cold outreach. So if you're achieving at a greater than one in a hundred outreach ratio, you're already doing great. But like, if you're, if you're much higher than that, then you're like, you're amazing in terms of how, how effective you are. But Doug Rushkoff, who's the author of yeah, yeah. all kinds of stuff. Cyber, yeah. kind of science fiction I reached novels. reached out to Doug, Doug like a year and a half, maybe two years ago, and asked if he wanted to be on my podcast. And he was like, I would like to. I'm really busy, yada, yada. And like, I still haven't met with him, but we've, we've had like a number of times where we've come really close. And he's been like, oh, now last minute I have to go do this other thing. Or, or for some reason, like I couldn't go. But we've be developed this like relationship where I ask him for advice now and he'll like reach out when something strikes his fancy or whatever. And like, that's all because I, I reached out just from that thing and decided even though he couldn't do it and, 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 you know, and I just kept it going. And so that's, you can do that with people. Right. And then you never know where it ends up. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the initial thing you were trying to sell them yeah. on, maybe something else, but are you going to write, I think you should write, uh, the, st the, the stoic salesman, the stoic Boom. salesman, the, 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 the 21st century guide to being the best salesman you could be. Yeah. The and, and then I'm serious. Guy. Then you're going to get gigs as a, a speaker for, and then you'll start writing articles for, I don't know, Forbes or Inc or whatever about yeah. stoicism and sales. <laughs> you'll sign up with a speaker's agency. Oh, I'm the, I'm the stoic sales guy. Don't I'm you know me? Here's, what, here's, here's my book. And they're going to start booking you at every, you're going to, you're going to make a lot of money at corporate gigs. You need to do this in the next 30 days. I'm going to. Brendan Lemon, you need to do the, write the, the stoic salesman, the, stoic the salesman. 21st century guide to, or the, the ancient philosophy guide to to being the 21st century south so boom I should, the, the 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 second century bc guide to being the greatest 21st century salesman yes <laughs> i like it i would buy it and i would go to that talk well probably not but i would <laughs> if i was a salesman i would if i was a salesman i would uh All so right. like we well, had, now i have to now i have to do that we had taoism and comedy we had the eightfold path from buddhism and parenting we had stoicism and sales so it could be applied to anything and it again anything. these structures that quote that i just read you it's not like a random quote that quote was focus grouped by <laughs> 2500 years of people 
curating quotes from the Stoics. I just love and and that one. So I Google it, and that's the first one that comes up. Yeah. So we know that people will resonate with these ideas. I just love that. And when you it's think like about primal. it, when you think about it, this is kind of what you know. Like, there's a whole group of like Christian writers who have been doing this for a long time. They have like the Christian guide to marriage, the Christian guide to, and it's whatever. It's the same thing. They're just taking things from the Bible and applying it. And then when you think about it, this, the Sun Tzu's The Art of War, this is like, you know, business people have been doing this since whenever that was, you know. Oh yeah. And the Art of War has so many great quotes that yeah. can be applied, but even better, or not, not better necessarily, but The Art of War was one book among seven that were considered like these classic, uh, uh, you know, Asian, you know, strategy guides on war. Well, yeah. Art of War was just one of them, but it kind of was made the most popular, was sort of the first translated and Napoleon mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. quote it or whatever. But you, but it's even good to take an obscure text that also has withstood the test of time, but no one knows about it at all and just totally rip from that for yeah. your book. Because <laughs> no one will know. And 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 by I the way, it. it's good. again, <laughs> advice that is yeah. primal to us. It's withstood the test of time. So, okay, the 30-day book challenge you're going to come back in 30 days and I really want to see the hey, stoic we'll mark, we'll mark, salesman. mark the calendar cuz it's what what is it? we'll do it's January 26th right now. I'll come back. Let's say let's just say February 29th. Let's right. put it at the end of that month. And uh so good thing for you it's a leap year. So yeah. <laughs> I got that, that extra 24 hour period of time. You got a little 24 Knowing hour Knowing me it'll be like there. me in college where I'll be like on the 28th I'm like, "Oh shit, I got to write this whole book." Yeah, but the whole the point the whole point is okay, I'm just going to take 30 quotes and I'm going to write as many stories as possible. This is a 20 page book but i'm uploading it to amazon today i'm gonna find a cover on the in the kindle they have like six thousand covers you could choose yeah. from and then and then you, you don't you don't have to pick an isbn yeah. number or you can you can use do their ASIN own yeah. number they're so easy they make it so easy to publish a book and, and by the way it's paperback and kindle yeah like they, people don't realize that it's not just ebook it's it's paperback too and then you could read it it could be an audiobook and then you have like a full that's exactly what i did with uh i did a the the cold call like a comedian the, which was the first one I released on Amazon. And I literally just did all that stuff. Went to canva.com, literally just drew a stick figure for the front cover. And like, and it's on, it's on Amazon and people are reading it. People like, like 300 people in India read it like last, last month. So I had to go on an Indian tour. Yeah, you need to go on the Indian tour. Big, yeah. The only problem is like, I'll, I'll reach out to Russell so Peters. You write, you probably will do better with $30,000 per talk than 30,000 rupees per talk. But yeah. <laughs> that's, Wait That's a minute! Okay. I only made start. I only made seventeen dollars. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to stay in India because you then it's then it, a rupee goes a longer way. A, ru a rupee goes a rupee goes a long will, way. Which will be the topic <laughs> of your novel about your sales tour. It all started when I was sitting on the couch. And That's true. Jobs I'll just house. rip it word from word from Heart of Darkness, and it'll just be about me being in India, and it's, right. it'll be called uh, a rupee goes a long way. Right. Exactly. Well, all the, right. You can write the foreword. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, and I'll plagiarize it from one of my uh, from the forward of one of my books, and but it's all legal. It's all legal plagiarizing. And by the way, everybody like Zen in the Art of Archery, the Legend of Bagger Vance, yeah, uh, the Tao of Pooh, like yeah, all all. I'm sure there's books the sales. There's nothing Bible. new under the sun. Everything is just ripped from something else. I mean, like the like you said, like Tao of Pooh is ripped from from Taoist books, and uh, coronavirus is just ripped from SARS a few years ago. <laughs> I feel like they told God totally plagiarized the DNA of that one. He's like, this worked over here. I'm gonna just do it over here now. I just feel like the ch the, ch the Chinese just keep <laughs> just keep jacking yeah, they these just, uh, They just take our IP. We made the flu, and now they're running with it. So <laughs> it was the Spanish flu first, right? Damn it, we gave it to them. Um, all right, thanks so much. This went a totally different. This went off the rails completely from our original topic, which was to discuss why you should the, only work four days the a week. Four day work week, which was kind of a rip off of the four hour work, uh, the, the four hour work week. So, uh, but all right, thanks so much. I really, at some point, I want to talk about that though. Let's talk why about it right now. We're not yeah. done. We well, want to want to walk. We can release some over uh, more than one period yeah, yeah. of time. You could, yeah. Do Did you know that franchise owners are more likely to start a successful business than entrepreneurs who go it alone? Neighborly offers 19 premier brands with services that repair, maintain, and enhance homes. With Neighborly, you'll get the business model, marketing resources, and corporate support you need to pursue a rewarding future. Learn more about joining over 5,000 Neighborly franchises by downloading your free guide at go.nbly.com podcast.